Hello everybody. As you know, many of you have seen the wild dogs on the Arethusa camera. And the bad news is that they have headed south out of an area that we are allowed to go into. So unfortunately we can't follow them. Um, there are about 7,000 vehicles trying to follow them at the moment, so I'm not actually that upset about it, uh, but for the fact that I wanted to see them. Um, we're going to hang around in and around the general area in case they do turn and come north. Um, it's not impossible. I'm going to head towards that airstrip where we were earlier and see if they don't pop out there. Sorry, one second. Okay, anyway, um, and what's important to notice is that the, apparently, so there have been a lot of questions about whether the, fe the gravid female has given birth or not. Um, we saw her not last about a week and a half to two weeks ago, I think a week and a half ago, and she was looking like she was about to give birth. So I think it's quite likely that she has. Um, we haven't seen or heard of her giving birth yet. But I suspect quite strongly that the pack would have found a termite mound with a hole in it and she would have given birth there. So that's the story there. Okay, we're going to head towards that airstrip and we might be lucky they might pop out there. Okay, thanks. There's lots of, uh, lots of noise going on on the radio, so if I suddenly start speaking nonsense it's because my brain is unable to uh, speak to you and listen to the uh, incessant chatter in my ear from the from the other game drives trying to follow the dogs. Right. Andrew is in tears. I'm in tears. I'm sure you're all in tears. Take my gloves off. Don't care if my hands freeze. It has warmed up quite a lot, which is very nice. Um, but to miss the wild dogs is a sadness. I'm just going to have a quick listen and just check on my map as to where they are. I can hear where they are and make sure they aren't coming north agile um, it's generally got to do with some sort of physical defect or some sort of physical advantage but birds are as agile as they need to be so if we look at something like a batelier which has got no tail um, it's not particularly agile but it can fly very low and its strategy is not built around being agile then if we look at a crowned eagle or a, a black sparrow hawk which got a long tail and specifically designed for speed, um, they will nip through the branches at great speed and be able to turn on a tiki. Um, and so you'd describe them as pretty agile. And then if you look at something like a falcon, uh, it's pretty agile, um, but its wings are designed so that it can dive at great speed and then swoop up again. Um, a swift is incredibly agile um, but not particularly stable so lots of different bird designs um, and various kind of agilities but remember that a bird is only not agile out here because it doesn't need to be unlike a human being which you know we we tend to be because of our sedentary lifestyle we tend to lose our agility pretty much as soon as we stop being children unless we're professional athletes. And if you'd ever seen Andrew and I on the touch field, or the touch rugby field, you'd know that um, we weren't professional athletes. Sorry about the bumps. Hold on, don't spill your coffee. Still 
trying to follow what's going on with that sighting on the radio, but it sounds to me like it's almost gone silent. And I think that's because they've crossed onto another reserve where they use a different channel. But at least some of you got to see them on the Arathusa cam. That's more than a Andrew and I got. And the presence of dogs in the area might also explain the lack of antelope. If they've run through here, it's so interesting, you know, when you watch, if an impala sees a leopard or a lion, it will alarm call that sort of barking. <coughs> when they see wild dogs, they don't even bother, they just run. They don't alarm call, they just take off at 100 miles an hour. No, they're still definitely off the reserve. But we'll head to the airstrip anyway. There are some impalas. Stop and have a quick look at them with a water butt. They win, Andrew. Is that work for you? Mm. For the impala, yeah. Okay. So we've got some batch, a bachelor herd of impala here. And all these bachelors, oh, there are a couple of females there too, but you can see the bachelors are tolerating each other's presence now. And the females are all pregnant, if they're going to be pregnant this year. We will have little baby impalas growing in them for the next six and a half months. And we, it's the most wonderful time if you're still around in November. It's well worth watching us and watching the, the lambs as they come out. The ubiquitous fork tail drongo. And thank you, William, for pointing out that I don't know why it has a fork tail. I must find out about that. And there is a water buck. There are two of them actually. There's another one just in front. And the reason that they will hang around with the impala is for vigilance, for safety. There are quite a few animals that will do that. They will lurk around impala because they're so vigilant and so good at spotting predators. And obviously if you're a bull on your own and you don't have a herd, that is an excellent strategy. If I was living in the bush alone, I would definitely hang around some impala I wouldn't have to keep my eyes open all the time. I'm just going to be silent for a second. You can actually hear them all grazing. You can just hear their little mouths tearing at the, tearing at the fresh shoots that they can find. Not many fresh shoots at this time of the year. So they'll browse quite a lot um, at this time of the year, will the impalas. And the bush and the water buck, of course. And there are actually three water buck bull there, bulls in front of us. This will be a small bachelor herd of bulls that are definitely very territorial. The the uh, around water are the mature bulls, and so young bulls will struggle to maintain any kind of territory. Right. I'm just going to sneak a little bit forward. Just to keep 
keep you updated. The pack of dogs is still, I'm afraid, far off here. It's quite nice there. I'm sorry. Throwing Andrew around a bit. There we go. He's actually a fairly magnificent bull, this. I suspect because of the, um, because of the, the, there are, there are one or two sort of water holes on this reserve, but I su suspect because there are only sort of one or two, you'll probably find a big territorial bull somewhere around each, and even relatively mature bulls like this one we're looking at now will be forced into some kind of bachelor herd where they will have to live with the boys because it's just, it's just too difficult. There's not enough sort of in the way of separate water holes for them all to have a territory around. There you can see eating quite long grass. That's nice to see. They um they don't we often wonder what which pieces of the grass they eat and what do you if you look carefully there they're not selecting any of the stalks on which the seeds grow so he's selecting specifically um, the leaves they are dry but they are the leafy part at the bottom of the grass or a little bit higher up from the ground than the than the impala might feed and remember the drier the grass gets the more crucial becomes the need to drink. There are some impala alarm calling. They're a long way away. That's what made that, wa that uh, water bug lift his head there. Beautiful bird song now, as the sort of relaxed nature of the midday of the mid morning starts to infuse the bush around us. And I just want to sneak forward and just see if we can't see what bird that is making that call. Oh, there, you can actually see it there. Or one of them. Can you look? Can you see on the front there? Black and white bird. Well spotted. Very sweet little fellow that. That was one of those grey crowned helmet shrikes that we had earlier. Okay, let's sneak a little bit forward. Right, there are a whole lot more water duck pools in there. We'll go past them now. It's a real old bachelor group of these chaps. It's actually very interesting. I've seen far more water buck bulls and far more buffalo bulls than I have females of either species. And that's that's odd, I think. There's a little raptor up on that dead log, that dead tree there, Andrew. Can you see that? I see him. Oh, that's lovely. I don't know how close in can we can get. Is that, is that it? That's how close I can yeah. get, yeah. Sorry, that's as close as in as we can get. That is called a lizard buzzard. Lizard buzzard. Um, unsurprisingly, little uh, meat-eating bird that eats lizards, amongst other things. I'll show you a picture of him for those of you who can't see him properly. You see the lizard buzzard. I'm going to have another look in case I'm telling you a lie, which I think I might be. 
because he's so fluffed out that it's because of the cold. I think I have lied to you. I apologize for that. He is in fact a Gabar goshawk. Is he? Yes, I think he's a Gabar goshawk. Ooh, dear. I'm getting myself confused here. I'm going to have one more look with my powerful binoculars, which are not quite powerful enough. Now, he is a lizard buzzard. That is correct. looking for lizards. Not very big. We'll show you a picture of him now. Find him again. There he is. Number one there. That's him there. Pink legs, pink beak, important distinguishing features. He's barred from his chest down. Um, and he's all pinkish leg, uh, legs and beak. And sear. The sear is the top of the beak where the nostrils are and that's what he's got and I mean the, I'm pretty sure that's what he is were he to fly off and um, we'd be able to see because of the two flashes of white there that you'll see on his tail there he goes he's diving down into the ground hopefully he's caught himself a lizard I don't think he'll fly back oh, there he goes flown off but not back to the same place unfortunately. Sorry about that Andrew. Right, let us move slowly along. Hello Derek on Twitter, you postulate that perhaps, and this is a good one, I'm just not entirely convinced of it. You, you say that perhaps the forktail drongo is, has got that specific tail design because he's acrobatic in flight. Um, he is acrobatic in flight, but, but so is the square-tailed. Um, but there might be some form of uh, acrobatic advantage that that tail does give him and her. My, yeah, it's possible. So if I think of the flight of the forktail drongo, especially if they are um, mobbing or attacking um, sort of predatory predatory birds, uh, they do. They are excellent at flying up and then flipping over and coming back down again. I don't know if maybe that's what the forktail helps them to do. Okay, right, now we're going to drive to the southern end of this airstrip and see if we can't maybe pick up the dogs. I'm pretty sure that they're, they're still south of us. And while we do that, we're going to cross over to Brent, who I believe is um, flummoxing a few of you with his plant quiz. We'll see you a little bit later. Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, we are still on the hunt uh, for some of the remaining tree species. We got one more, I think, that's going to sort of tie up with the other two. So we're going to keep looking for that. We are still checking this area 
that possibly Cindela could be in. I haven't seen any tracks yet, unfortunately, though. But we will keep checking. Billy from California. Billy, welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Um, Billy has asked about that lion track I saw a bit earlier. And I said it was a bit confusing and it, I didn't think it was particularly fresh. Um, it is quite difficult on that road because it is a main access road. The edge of the tracks become quite worn. I'll try to get to a spot where we can see some tracks nicely and I'll show you how a track ages. And the little things we look at to see the age of tracks obviously there's quite obvious things like uh, if another animal has walked uh, uh, over the top especially like your nocturnal animals um, so civets genets and those type of things oh there's actually a little bird we struggle to get in the camera sometimes and just if we zoom in on that fallen down log there there's two of them hopping around there and there's a little chin spot battis as well and i've tried quite a few times to get them on camera we just wait for them to hop up and the others just off to the left i'm going to try edge a little bit there we go just wait hop up be a good little there he is definitely one of my favorite little birds while i'm walking through the bush they make quite a lot of noise um, very distinct black and white. So, I know it's a very difficult sighting. Oh, there's a little chin spot battis in front. Not who we're after at the moment. Um, try edge a little bit there. There you see him flapping. There you go. There he is. Very difficult, so I'm going to try to get a little bit closer now. I've tried to get them on camera a few times, but they are quite busy little birds. And normally always in pairs, and the other one has flown off already. And so is that one, but there the two of them are. In that tree at the back there. There we go. There he is. Oh, to the right, took off. And there, up to the right. Out in the open, up to the right. Come out a bit. There we go. There we go. That's definitely the best view we've had of this bird. I wonder who could tell me what this bird is. You can see he's looking for insects and spiders checking very carefully very busy little birds this is definitely the best sighting i've had on them since i've been on the live drives because they are so busy they're quite often difficult to get into the shot so you can see he doesn't sit still for very long Let's see if i can try to get it to come a bit closer there we go top of screen top of screen not paying any attention to my alarm calls continuing feeding um if you do know what bird this is let me know you can do that by sending your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on twitter it's got a very sort of zit -do -zit -do -do call i'm not making it at the moment too busy feeding And off the goes. Well done, nice fall. 
So, I wonder who knows what that one is. Looks like no one's checked this road yet this morning, which is always a positive for me, because I get to see what's been happening first on the tracks. Hi, John from California. Welcome on the Sunrise Safari. Uh, John would like to know if I've got any information uh, about whether that young male lion is uh, still with the Incahumas. Uh, the last time I saw them, John, he was. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether he, if he still is at the moment. Uh, but I will try to find out during the course of the day. Well done to Joanne in Arizona, um, who has got that bird spot on. It was a southern black tit, and strangely enough, it seems like James was also showing you southern black tits this morning. And also, Judith um, on Twitter was the first with the southern black tits. Hi, Sam. Um, we've had some more information from Sam about frog hopper beetles or um, spittle bugs. And uh, Sam was just letting me know that it can't be a, a beetle due to the fact of uh, it's how its mouth parts work. Um, I did know that, Sam. Thanks very much for that. But uh, the colloquial term for them in this part of the world and, and in quite a few of the insect books is that of a frog hopper beetle. Although scientifically incorrect, like quite a few of the common names, it is the sort of local common name for them, a frog hopper beetle. So, but thanks very much, Sam. And hopefully when the summer months come, we can definitely try to find some. So I'm just going to have a quick look at this junction for tracks and to see if we can find a nice track that we can show you to how tracks age. Just so this is just a photo out with Billy from California. He was wondering how we age tracks. So I'm going to try to find some really fresh tracks of any animal and then I'll try age them for you. Connor from Denver, Colorado. Connor would like to know if we get many monitor lizards in the area. 
We do, Connor. We get two very distinct types. Um, we have the water or Nile monitor that we find around the dams uh, and water points in the reserve. And then we have the rock monitor, uh, which is a more sort of a terrestrial species and she lives in dead trees and holes. Oh, hello. There's quite a few animals off to the left here, including some warthog. I'm just going to move around so where we can possibly see them. This also, they are moving through, so I'm going to try and get ahead of them so they move into frame. Look at those biggies. Gone into a bit of a dip. Oh, well, I'll wait for the, the warthog. There's some kudu and some pala. All feeding on the edge of this sea plant. Oh, there's some more warthogs. Lots of warthogs around here this morning. So we got a nice group of kudu, a few young ones in there, some adult females. I can't see any adult males. I'm just waiting for the warthogs to walk out into the open. There comes one now. We're quite close to the old or hyena den that's not being used at the moment. There's, let me have a look, the warthog's going to, there he is, warthog. Come to the left a little bit, behind that bush willow. But heading this way, and there's another put you in the background there. Mm, I think so. And the warthog seems to have stopped. There's a few more warthogs that are just quite difficult to see. There we go. Phil's got them. So there we go. Quite a nice little section of general game here. Um, we've got kudu, warthog, impala. Oh, something spooked everyone. And I'm not sure what it was. I don't think it was us. I think one of the warthogs might have had a, a slight panic, as they do from time to time. Not being as tall as everyone else, they can't see as well. And general rule with animals, if one runs, all run. Okay, so you let me know where's good for you. Well, so you're going to be able to get my foot and I'm going to go down. Okay, so here we go. How's my audio? Okay, so you can see there's a nice fresh branch track. And um, one of the ways we would age tracks, Billy, is um, if we looked for specific species that leave other tracks. So in the early morning, the first bird on the road is an emerald spotted wood dove. And if there were tracks going across, need something a bit thicker. So if there were tracks going across my boot track like that, I would know that that track was from the night because the emerald spotted wood doves would have been the first to cross in the morning. And you do the same with civet tracks, that will mean it was later in the night. Uh, and then another big thing that ages tracks is wind. Now you can see that my track, the edges aren't sharp. Um, so now I start thinking that possibly this track is a little bit older, maybe even from yesterday and there's been wind during the day. Um, or dust from a vehicle driving past that's covered it and stopped those defined edges. But now you look at my other fresh track there, and nice sharp edges, very nicely defined, compared to this, which is now looking like it's been there for a while. Well, I hope that helps a little bit, Billy, with you understanding how we age tracks. Thank you.
Okay. Let's continue on for a bit and see what else is out there. So, while we continue on looking for that last tree species, um, that for a very special question we're going to do a little bit later, I went across across to James and see what he's been up to on Arethusa. Yeah. Have a good day. Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to Wendy. We have found some buffalo. Uh, they're just south of the road here. Andrew is going to pan to them. And I was talking earlier about how unusual I have found that there, there seem to be very few herds of females in this area. Uh, large bachelor herds of, of bull, buffalo. I've never seen buffalo, um, bachelor herds of buffalo this often. Um, and I'm not really sure why that is. So again, any theories that might come through from the Twitterverse would be great. Uh, like that one about the Drongo's tail, which I think is a, is a good one, now that I think of it. Um, so, bachelor bulls, all on their own. Some of them, I mean, now this is for the for the less squeamish or for the more squeamish. This won't be an ideal sort of thing to look at. But what you can see on some of them is a that the scrotum has almost atrophied, and that normally happens when the bull is no longer sort of a breeding age. But a lot of these bulls are definitely still of breeding age, and they really are wasting their time around here if they're see seeking opportunities. Apparently there is a herd of females quite far to the north of where we are, but I've, I've only seen one herd of females come through here. And by females I mean breeding herds, so there is a herd uh, that has got bulls in it as well. But these old boys, and they're not so old, half of them, um, seem to hang out on their own. I saw a little herd of bachelors yesterday with a very young bull who was barely an adult. And so what you find is that it, it might be, I'll tell you what the, the reason might be, is that the, the, the young bulls who don't ha can't have mating opportunities because they're not big enough yet, and the older bulls who are just perhaps um, not quite strong enough to compete for mating opportunities anymore, they find that it's easier to live on their own, they don't have to move as far, and they don't have to deal with the nagging of the children in the herd, um, and they can sort of move in a less, in a smaller area. Uh, they need water, they need grazing, but they don't have to worry too much about moving around like the big herds do, because the grazing is obviously, the bigger the herd, the further they're going to have to walk to find food. So that's perhaps why. So the young and old, I suspect it has everything to do with mating opportunities. So the younger you are, um, obviously you're not big enough, and then when you get just beyond prime age, you start to lose a bit of strength, and it becomes difficult to maintain mating, mating opportunities. These are still very powerful animals, though. A lion, lions will think twice before taking on something this size. In fact, I've seldom heard or seen um, kills of buffalo where there haven't been mature male lions involved in the kill. This one's got a white eye. It does seem to have a white eye. Is that not just the camera? No, it's not. That's right, Andrew. Can you see that, everyone? He's got a white eye. So it looks like a cataract from here. I'm no ophthalmologist. But it's, it's either a cataract or more likely what's happened is that he spiked it on a thorn. And that has probably rendered it blind. I suspect that he cannot see out of that eye. It is watering slightly. Ugh. It does not look comfortable. Now when people talk about buffalo being dangerous, um, I of course don't like to use the term dangerous at all out here. Uh, potentially dangerous is as far as I'm prepared to go. 
But um, an animal like that, you see, might turn into a potentially dangerous animal because he will feel threatened by the fact that he can't see. And as soon as an animal becomes threatened, well, then they start to become a lot more nervous. And when they become nervous, they become potentially dangerous. And so if he can only see through one eye, I mean, he's the kind of animal you might walk into by mistake during the night and he'll get a fright more easily, perhaps, than some of the others. Lots of scratching about, and the ubiquitous fork forktail drongo is never far behind a herd like this. Um, there's one just behind the one that's scratching himself there on a tree. I don't think Andrew will pick him up behind all of the bushes. You can see the red on the top of that one's horns as he's scratching and that's from scratching against slightly bigger trees, often marula trees or there you can hear the ox peckers coming in. Right, I think we're going to, what these, what these bulls will do now is sort of lie down in the shade and chew their cud and they'll move off to have a drink later in the day I'm sure um, and then they'll just rest for most of the rest of the day. So we're going to leave them to that as the heat starts to build quite nicely. Um, Andrew is still dressed like a, a bank robber with a, a sort of a thermoregulation issue. Um, I have shed at least three layers by this stage of the morning. We're going to head up towards, um, there's a water hole just up ahead on the off chance that uh, a bevy of elephants has come down there, but uh, who knows. Luck has not been with Wendy today. Oh, and I just did want to tell you, um, and thank you for telling Brent that we had seen the, um, the southern black tit. So Kadria, William, Chris and Safari, thank you very much for your um, contributions on the design of the forktail Drongo's tail. Um, you seem to confirm that it does have something to do with maneuverability and aerodynamics. Um, so I think let's, let's go with that theory for now. And now let's try and find out or think about what it is specifically about the Drongo's flight that necessitates that forked tail. Now I suppose the best way to do that or to find out would be to check if we can't find another bird that has a similar design and have a look at what its sort of strategy is for flight um, or to just observe a, a drongo in flight. And what I, like I said to you, the one very characteristic thing that they seem to be able to do and I don't think I've seen other birds do is almost do like a backflip. So they'll take off They'll bomb, a, if they, say there's a brown snake eagle sitting on a marula tree, they'll bomb that brown snake eagle and then flip up and over and down. And I wonder if there's something in that uh, forktail design that allows them to be able to do that backflip. I'm guessing entirely here. Thank you very much for your contributions. I, like I say to you quite often, um, I tend to learn as much on these things, that, uh, on these drives, that, as you do.
Shorty on Twitter. Thank you for your question. A good one. Do ox packers alarm call? Um, nice question because it's important. Uh, I'm just going backwards here, not because I'm trying to be artistic about my answer, but because I've seen some leopard tracks. Unfortunately, they go next door and they're not very new. I believe Brent showed you um, how to age lip or age some tracks, um, and those ones were pretty indistinct. Even though they're in the sand, that doesn't that makes them pretty difficult to age. Um, but they were pretty indistinct. So, Shorty, if that is indeed your name, um, I have been called that from time to time. Um, Oxpeckers do alarm call. They make like a buzzing sound that that sound that you heard there when they were coming in and um, to land is the alarm call is very similar to that and it's important because when you're walking in the bush and you hear that alarm call they're often alarm call of predators which will put the animals that they're sitting on so like those buffalo on high alert and what you don't want is to um, blunder into some buffalo or rhino when you're walking and so you listen very carefully out for that alarm call and they'll alarm call at us which warns the animals that they're sitting on um, so it's a really nice early warning signal for us as well good question Deborah, Deborah in Kentucky, I've never been asked this before. Um, thank you for your question. You seem to be a keen uh, rangeland scientist um, and you're quite interested in that grass that we were looking at on the termite mound called Chlorus roxburgiana. Chlorus is spelled, if I'm not mistaken, I'm a horrific speller, uh, C-H-L-O-R-S, that's C-H-L-O-R-S, and Roxburghiana is R-O-X-B-U-R-G-H-I-A-N-A. -A. So R-O-X-B-U-R-G-H, Roxburgh, and then I-A-N-A. -A. Chorus Roxburghiana. William in Virginia Beach, thank you. You've, you seem to have uh, definitively solved the forktail drongo problem. There's one flying here, Andrew. Let's just try and get him while we talk about this. Sorry, he's gone a bit further. Um, William in Virginia Beach, you say that you have found that a forktail, well, not that you found, that you found research that says a forktail like that um, with a an angle of 120 degrees, I think it was, is the almost universally accepted optimum um, for flight maneuverability, um, especially uh, with, in terms of pitch and yaw, which I think if I understand correctly, pitches would be up and down and yaw would be from side to side. So it would seem that the, the fork is, is, that, is for that, especially when spread. What I suspect is therefore that and in fact, I think of a crowned eagle in flight. It doesn't have a very um, straight tail when it's spread out. They've probably also got a bit of a fork there. And so while the, the fork-tailed drongo has a permanent fork, I suspect some of the other very maneuverable birds then can probably fork their tails almost uh, at will. That is fascinating information and I'm glad we've had a, such a great discussion on it.
And Safari, you want to know what a forktail drongo eats, um, which of course ties in with the discussion on its flight. A forktail drongo will hawk insects from a perch. So what they do is they'll sit on a perch and as an insect flies out, they'll grab it. And the other, so it helps to be very maneuverable. Sorry, I know the other bird that does uh, often have forked tails are the, um, uh, are the bee eaters, which are like little fighter jets. So they also can, can move, uh, they also hawk insects in the air and their maneuverability is obviously enhanced by that forked tail. And the other thing that the drongo has, of course, is the whiskers on the side of its beak which allowed, which sort of helped to knock insects into its beak. So the, indeed, and some people have pointed out that swallows have forked tails um, in North America. They have them here too. Um, not sort of uh, pronouncedly forked, but sort of curved like that. Um, and, and that obviously they're the most, some of the most maneuverable birds in the world. And also, of course, use um, uh, hawk insects out of the air. Thank you all for your contributions and that really is fascinating to me. Um, we're going to cross over to Brent and just see what he's managed to find. And we're going to head off to the waterhole and we'll see you just now. Welcome back everyone and as I said a little bit earlier I was going to try to find a, a rain tree where we can discuss uh, the noise it makes or the apple leaf. So we found one here that is, we found quite a lot but they were all way too big for me to do anything with and make, try to see if I can make the noise of, of, of the tree making rain. But here we have one that's been pushed over by elephants it looks like. So if you're ready I'm going to go pretend to be the wind um, through the tree. And also the last member of our plant for the medicinal part is there. So here we go. Let's try pretend to be the rain. Try and find a good spot to climb. And so hopefully the mic picks up the noise of the leaves. So right now, we're going to try it. Listen. I don't do quite as good a job as the wind. I'm going to try shake. Not quite the same as the real thing, I'm afraid. But as a kid, for me, it really sounded like rain. But uh, maybe not so much. But the last plant as well. I sneak back. Okay, I'm back after making myself look like a bit of a baboon in the tree. Sorry, let me prepare myself here. Um, we discussed, we got a very nice question in from Sandy in Virginia. And she wanted me to see if there were any medicinal plants. Sorry, I might think my ears are caught on something here. There we go, that would make sense. Um, Sandy from Indiana. Um, that was the tree at the back there. That is a silver cluster leaf. So since that's the last tree we've got, we'll start with it. So we have the, the branch here. And Sandy's question was, 
specifically um, about medicinal plants that could be used to treat open wounds. So I've got quite a nice book that specifically deals with the medicinal uses of uh, of trees. So we did a little bit of research while we we're off air, and um, here we go. We have a silver cluster leaf, and um, this is used in tropical Africa, so not so much down here uh, to treat open wounds. And the way they pre uh, pre prepared is um, the leaves are actually mixed in and crushed into a paste, um, sometimes with mealy meal, and then applied to the wound. So unfortunately, we don't have all the tools to actually try and make the concoction here, but um, it is the leaves are crushed and I suppose ground with a, a pest, a pestle probably, so ground into a paste, and they'll probably use, a, let me just check here, um, maybe a bit of fat or, or, or oil um, in that to get a bit of a sticky substance to it, and then that would, have been, that would be placed on the open wound. Interestingly enough, that um, no, used more common in this part of the world to treat eye infections and for uh, pneumonia. And the bark is taken as for diabetes. So the bark again is ground with a pestle into a, into a paste into, or actually into a fine powder once it's a bit dry. And then that is taken as a, a control for diabetes. So that was the, one of the three species that is used for open wounds that we see quite regularly in this area. And the other one is one we all know very well. <laughs> And it is a buffalo thorn. And you can see those very distinct one straight thorn, one hooked thorn. So a very important species, not only spiritually from a lot of African cultures, but also medicinally. Um, so it's a decoction of the roots and roots and leaves are basically boiled and then also ground into a, a paste again and they are applied ex externally on the body to boils and um, open wounds glandular swellings as well but not only for healing but also for pain relief so here's another one and when we know more about the sort of spiritual side we speak about how the straight thorn so the hook thorn captures the spirit of the deceased um, relative that has died far away from the, the, uh, their home and then the straight thorn releases that spirit back into the traditional home. But we've spoken about that quite often. We haven't really done the other medicinal things. Um, roots also used as a remedy for diarrhea and dysentery. Um, apart from all of that, the leaves are edible and can be used in salad. Uh, this one I'm not going to eat today because I picked it up off a main road, so I think I'd get <laughs> more dust than, than leaf. So I'm not going to chew this one today. Don't feel like having a mouthful of sand. And then the third and final one is also quite a common species we see. Um, it looks a lot like an acacia, but when I was explaining that it doesn't have thorns, it's got spines. So spines are modified branchlets that have become into a sharp edge that are used to help protect the tree. And it is quite, its common name is a, a sickle bush or sometimes called a Chinese lantern tree. And I'll show you why it's called Chinese lantern tree a little later. Here we go. Let's just see how they put it together. There we go. Ash from the incinerated seed pods, um, together with roots of uh, two other species, two other flowers, a Brachynrygia and a Solanum, are mixed with Vaseline, so also like a fat-based or oil-based thing, um, and, and applied to wounds. And very, very interesting. They also has a pain relief uh, facet with them. Uh, they also, it's used quite a lot for quite a lot of things, um, toothache, backache, syphilis, lepsary, um, it's used as a purgative, an aphrodisiac, um, also used as a sort of traditional, the roots are ground up and mixed with other plants, 
uh, to use for infertility, so an inf a fertility drug, and quite, quite interesting. So this book goes a little bit more in depth. So the dried fruits are shown to have an antimicrobial activity. So there is a bit of sort of a healing in it. But I'll show you now what the seeds look like and why it's sometimes called a Chinese lantern tree. So the seeds of the sickle bush are very sickly and roundly shaped. And we don't have any at this time of the year. But there we go. That's it. And then if we go a little bit to the right, you'll see the flowers. They're said to look like Chinese lanterns. So when this tree is in flower, it's very, very pretty. And there'll be a lot of them. As you can see up in the top. Look like little lanterns hanging off the tree. So Sandy from Indiana, I hope that helps uh, answer your question about the different tree species we get here um, that are used medicinally. I can now deposit these back into the bush. But now where's that buffalo thorn? Did I get the buffalo thorn? Because knowing my luck, it's the one I would sit on. Well, well it looks like it's escaped, so hopefully I don't end up with a thorn in my bottom. Just gonna have a quick look, but we're not far from the hyena den, so we're gonna have a quick look uh, at see if anyone's at home. We've checked quite a, a few times and we haven't had any luck yet, but hopefully, this morning our luck is changing. Um, William just made a comment that the, the tree sounded more like rain than the Cokie Franklin sounded like it was saying Cokie. Well, thanks very much for that, William. William also would like to know whether it's type um, A or type B diabetes and whether it is um, gestational. William, I'm not 100% sure, but I will have a go through this book and see if it does mention whether it is type, uh, type A or type B diabetes. Uh, maybe we'll, if there's some hyenas there, I'll have a quick look while we get to the hyena or once we're at the hyena den we're nearly there so everyone get your eyes ready remember quite often the adult hyenas might not lie right next to the den They'll be around, so we're looking for ear flicks, a tail flick to try to keep the flies away, even a slight little bit of movement. We're shade, a different body shape uh, in the grass or in the shade. Hi, Jim. Welcome on the Sunrise Safari, Jim. Um, I'm going to get to your question in a second, Jim. I just want to have a quick look around this hyena den. There are quite a lot of fresh tracks, and I did come here yesterday, so on top of my tracks. So hopefully someone's at home. Okay, we've got to go really quickly to James. He's got something really exciting. So we'll be back with you in a little bit. Hello everybody, look, we've just spotted, well I didn't spot, Andrew spotted those honey badgers. I'm just going to be quiet, they don't like my voice. Isn't that spectacular, a mother and her puppet looks like, and they've got something in their mouths. I don't know what they're eating. 
Come on, come back. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? Look at the size of the claws. Andrew, can you get them? Fully zoomed. The little baby. Trying to stay as low to the ground as possible, the little one is. The honey badger is not scared of much, so they've obviously assessed that we're not too much of a threat, so now they're coming a bit closer. They, were, they definitely had found something in the sand there that they were eating. Oh, that's wonderful. As we spotted them, Andrew said, this beats a herd of elephants, and I suppose it does because we so rarely see them. And the little one is still crouching to the ground. Look at that trot. Tail up. And they'll produce a very foul skunk-like smell if they are threatened. Sorry, Andrew, I don't think if I move, no, if I move forward, it's not going to get you in any better picture, I'm afraid. Oh, that's just great. What a special thing to see. Incredibly powerful. Uh, powerful animal for the size. Very loose skin so that when something like a lion takes hold of them or tries to take hold of them they basically just get a handful of skin like you would with a, um, a dog like a staffy or a um, or the scruff of a cat's neck but they've that, they're like that all the way around. There's a Franklin there that has either not seen them or is not particularly worried about them. Tremendous claws they've pretty much left us now great spot and Andrew I was waffling away about birds tails when Andrew spotted them <laughs> uh, Will, William I believe you you have called you have called this the holy grail of sightings thank you for that um, I tend to agree with you today especially spectacular called a honey badger apparently because they they do like to eat honey and they do like to eat the larvae of, uh, of bees um, and the big story of course is that of the honey badger and the honey guide which is a bird that comes along and will sit above you and chirp it's normal call or the the, the greater honey guide was the most common one here is a call that goes Victor, Victor, Victor. Um, but when it wants you to follow it, and when it goes and it, it finds an animal like that, it sits above them and chirs. And it's it's head pop up. Andrew says its head is over there. So while I continue to waffle, it's just behind that, um, that log there in the distance. That movement you can see in the grass there is the air it is, is the honey badger. They might come back. I'm seriously tempted to cut a piece off Andrew and just put it there and see if it doesn't tempt them to come out from hiding. Anyway, that bird will then lead the badger. That churring call is basically saying, follow me, follow me. And the bird will then follow the badger. The badger will then follow the bird, sorry, to a beehive. There he is looking up over the top. And once the beehive has been found, the badger will use those tremendous claws to tear open whatever piece of wood and that it, it happens to be in, um, exposing the bees. 
and the badger, because of its skin, is totally immune to the bee's uh, stings, and it will eat on the honeycomb, and the bird's reward is to eat on the bee larvae. That's what they like to eat. And that's why it's called a honey badger. But they'll eat anything. I mean, they'll eat any kind of meat. They're definitely a carnivore. Um, they'll probably eat the odd bit of fruit. But they'll eat termites and mice and ants and squirrels and a bit of carrion here and there, lizards and snakes. They'll definitely eat snakes. Um, and anything they can get their, hand, their teeth or claws into. <laughs> Marvellous. And very unusual to see them in the day. I mean, I've seen them a few times at night, uh, but mainly very seldom during the day. I'm afraid they've, they've, you can just see them through there. I'm afraid if I drove in there, they'd, they'd run away very fast. So we can't really get any closer. It'd be nice to move that tree out of the way, but if I went in on foot, they'd definitely run away. Deborah in Kentucky and Mary and Marianne in Boston and various other um, on the others in the Twitterverse. Um, Deborah, I think you said you've been watching the show for nine years and have never seen a badger before. Well, I'm so glad that that situation has been remedied by our faithful cameraman, Mr. Andrew, um, who's now shake quivering with excitement instead of cold. Isn't that wonderful as it sticks its head up through there? He's just checking, she's just checking to make sure we're not causing any trouble. Um, I think Marianne in Boston, you said they look a bit like skunks. They do look a bit like American skunks, uh, but they don't come from the same family as, mm, as far as I'm aware. Um, no, in fact, they do. They're from a family, well, they come, it's the same sort of, same, uh, Suborder they call the Caniformia or the dogs, and this is the family that they come from is called the Mustelid or Mustelidae, and that's the badgers and our weasels and the striped polecat. Now, striped polecat is basically our form of a skunk, and your skunk in North America comes from a family called the Mephitididae. Mephitidae. Mephitidae. We don't get any of those here, but similar sort of, same order, same suborder. Hello Rick and Susie, you ask a lovely question. Um, you're sitting in Hawaii. Lord knows what time it is there, at this time of the day. Um, I'm not sure if you're in tomorrow or still in yesterday. But uh, welcome to it and we're very happy to have you along. And lovely question. I think I know exactly where it comes from. There's a wonderful documentary about badgers where a badger gets bitten by, I think it's... Um, a snouted cobra, it may even be an Egyptian cobra, and, or, or a puff adder. Anyway, one of those snakes. And the badger seems to weaken, and then um, collapses, and, lie, and sort of goes into a, a coma. Um, and after, I'm not sure how long it is, I think it's about three or four or five hours, it wakes up, shakes its head, gets up, and trots off exactly like you just saw her trot off there. 
Um, so somehow the body of that badger processes this tremendously ho awful venom. I think it must have been a cobra because I think it was neurotoxic venom. And uh, badger gets up and walks off. So yes, reckon Susie, that you are remembering correctly that that it did happen in that documentary. And I'm pretty sure that they can their bodies are just able to process the proteins that are in those venoms that we we certainly couldn't. Curious one, uh, you have a good question. Do honey badgers den? Uh, the answer is yes, they do. They will uh, make a den, just like uh, so many of the other animals out here in a termite mound, um, smaller hole than the hyenas or wild dogs will use, obviously. And in fact, I suspect that this female and her and her pup were seen going into, there was a den just around here, um, not too long ago that I've checked out a few times and not seen anything there. Um, and I suspect that's where she and this pup were. I think at this age, though, probably out of the den, and wouldn't be. They'll they might go back to it in, in the, um, to to rest, but otherwise they'll find some thick bush to hide in. Still there, Andrew? Still there. I think Andrew might have a better view than the rest of us. I wonder if you can do that call again. Which call? The honey guide. I think he came out. I saw his head pop okay. up. Maybe. So we're just doing the honey guide call there. Andrew says he reckons that's what made her stick her head up. I'm not convinced myself. Uh, we haven't managed to induce her to do it. And we have a question from Dia in, Mia in Miami, Miami, Florida. Um, thank you for your question. You want to know, do they have a family unit like a human being or is it the female that does all the raising of the babies? Uh, there are no animals out here that have a family unit like the human being, really. Uh, so, and I'm afraid the onus of raising the young falls entirely on the mother, as you saw it there. I'm trying to see if we can't draw him out with some sort of alarm call. I'll try a dwarf mongoose. Well, not quite a dwarf mongoose. I'll make a sort of generic mongoosey type call. Definitely lifting her head now. Here we go. how long I can keep my tongue doing that. <laughs> Look at the little <laughs> little one with its tail up in the air. Well we got a bit of a view there. But I don't know that she's gonna come any closer. Should we try and just go a little bit up the hill here? We might get a view down through, down through there. In fact, I'm not going to move until you've, until you've lost, lost her completely. I think it might be now. Liz in Wisconsin, uh, are they related to wolverines? And uh, the wolverine, as far as I understand it. Um, it's probably related. I think it's from the same family. I have an excellent little book with me that I will check in right now for you. Certainly the same sub-order as we were looking at there. And I'm going to stop here and see if I can spot her through there. Liz, let me get back to you immediately. Um, I see no reference to the wolverine here, I'm afraid. Oh, here they come. Here they come. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that. Uh, Liz, sorry, this car is about to disappear down the road. Sorry about that, Andrew. Okay. 
Hello, Laura. You want to know if I've ever seen a honey badger take on a lion? Um, no, I haven't. But I've definitely heard of it happening. Um, and I, I know people who have seen them. Um, oh, look at that. That's just spectacular. I have seen, I've heard of them not taking on a lion, but certainly um, defending themselves successfully against a lion attack because of those vicious claws that they've got and they're incredibly strong for their height. Um, they do get killed every so often by lions, but most other animals other than lions will avoid them. I've never seen it personally though. disappearing into the undergrowth again. Liz, I will get back to you on your um, your Wolverine question. No doubt the Twitterverse will be able to find out immediately. Um, but I don't see a reference to a Wolverine here. I suspect it's part of the suborder Caney Formia. Or the dogs? Oh, they're going to cross the road up there. And they're going to cross, the, really? Yeah. yeah. And we can still see them, so I'm going to go forward quite quickly. Andrew spotted a road somehow. Here it is. It's the advantage of height, I suppose. Now, we don't want to go too fast, because then we'll flatten them. Andrew, if you see them, will you shout? Yeah. Well, don't sharp, just indicate with great enthusiasm. Any idea? Some big lion tracks on this road. Yeah, I've got them, I've got them. I've got them, I've got them. you got them? Yeah. Forward, back? A little bit back. Oh, there they are. I'll spot it. That's good. Andrew, yet again, is on fire. You know what it is, of course, is that I don't let him smoke on the vehicle, so his brain functions perfectly. Oh, that's wonderful. Hello everybody, um, we've only got two minutes left in theory, um, so for those of you who have to go and get on with your lives, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a wonderful morning, especially this latterly. Now we're going to stay with these honey badgers if you have still have the time, so those of you who have to leave, I'm sorry, we'll see you later this afternoon. Thank you for your contributions and your questions and everything else like that. And especially as we look at this kind of benchmark sighting for wild earth our first honey badger sighting cadria a special shout out to you who's been with us for nine years from the very beginning i mean that is astonishing um thank you for your support and for your continued contributions uh, so we'll for for those of you who have to go bye bye and have a marvelous night morning day evening wherever it is you might be thank you for watching and we're going to try and stay with them for a little bit longer for those who can and then we'll head off. I don't think that they're going to be particularly confiding. Andrew, should we go back a bit? Yeah, I've lost them now. And we do seem to have lost them. I'm just going to go back a little bit. If they win, I'm looking behind me so I can't see them. I'm not going to drive off-road because the crunching will definitely make them run away.
they've disappeared. They may be back in the drainage line. We'll have a quick look there. It might be time. No, everybody, I'm afraid I think that's it. But what a spectacular sighting that was. So we'll make our way slowly, slowly out of here. So, Ramey, you ask, are we going to have one more question on the hyena, on the honey badgers? Um, you want to know, uh, would a honey badger ever be killed by a hyena? Mm, yeah, possibly, it's possible. I mean, a hyena is a pretty brave thing, pretty strong, pretty big, pretty powerful. Um, but if it was a group of hyenas, absolutely certainly it would be, it would be a threat. You know, a honey badger is not exactly a delicious meal for anything. So they're and they're quite a it's quite a dangerous meal. It's a bit like um it's a bit like a baboon to a leopard. Um, it's baboons are apparently quite tasty for leopards, but it's a real risk to try and catch them because of their teeth and their size. And it's a it's a bit like that with um a bit like that with the with the honey badger and the hyenas. And Julie in California, we want to, you want to know why they're out in the day. I suspect uh, they were out in the cool morning and all that happened was that the sun came up and it became light and they just kept finding little bits and pieces to eat. So when we found them or when Andrew spotted them, as you saw, um, he was, or well, the female was, was eating something and I'm sure the baby obviously doesn't have a choice whether it can go to bed or not. Uh, but basically they'll, they will choose to move in the crep crepuscularly or into the night time but if there's food around during the day and they happen to be moving during the morning and they find food well, then they'll be out and especially if they don't feel threatened um, I'm sh I think the big male lion track we saw up there was probably from yesterday so everybody that's it thank you for staying with us especially if you ran over time with us um, we're going to head off to have breakfast. Andrew's about to expire from a lack of food um, and cold. He's used a lot of food in his, uh, the uh, generation of heat in his body today. And I'm feeling fairly peckish myself after watching those uh, badgers having. So we thank you again for all your contributions and questions. Especially love the discussion on uh, bird tails. Oh, I shall go and do some further research there. And we'll also try and find out if the honey badger is related to the wolverine. Have a marvellous day, evening, morning, uh, whatever part of the day you happen to find yourself, and we will see you a little bit later.